This episode of Beauty and the Surgeon podcast is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked is an online company dedicated to making professional health testing easy and accessible. Let's Get Checked offers fast, affordable, completely confidential at-home health tests from a range of tests from STDs, male and female hormones, and even COVID-19. Listeners of our podcast who are new to Let's Get Checked get 20% off by using our URL, trylgc.com slash beauty, and be sure to use the code beauty20 at checkout. That's trylgc.com, T-R-Y-L-G-C.com slash beauty, B-E-A-U-T-Y, and be sure to use the code beauty20, beauty20 at checkout. Do it. Getting tested is important. It's the responsible thing to do, and you know how important I think it is to make sure you understand your labs. Welcome everyone to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast. I'm Amy, I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm joined today, as always, by the very, very intelligent Dr. Jason Martin. Oh, thank you, thank you. He's that a board-certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Well, we're I was talking supposed about... to take off my surgical cap, and I didn't. It's too do late. It. You didn't get to do Damn a wardrobe it. change. <laughs> nope. <laughs> too bug. Nope. Too late. Too you're wearing late. it. You're keeping it. And I can just rip it off, but I'm going to have f- surgical cap head. Well, and your head would be cold. I, I Seriously, I can't. Like, at the end of the day, when I take my cap off, like, I get freezing. That's why I take it off right away or not right, at all. Right. Like, as soon as we're done, I take it off, because if not, I get, like, attached It's like to jumping it. into a cold pool. Yeah, you just got to do it, right? You never want to take it off. You just have, yep. So... Uh, today we are talking about research we're into. It's research we're into 5.0 because this is the fifth one of these we've done. Five times. Because we love we love research. We love research. If you are listening to this podcast and we'd like to watch it, there's not fun slides this time, so you'd just be watching Dr. Martin and I chatting. You can find us on YouTube at Jason Martin MD. We're also on- I don't our- know how engaging that is. I think it's engaging. It's more engaging than not. Okay. It's also everywhere you listen to uh, podcasts. I mean, occasionally we say funny things or do funny things, and yeah. I don't know what your research is about, so it might be funny research. Well, it's funny to us, and definitely Nils laughs. So hopefully, it's funny to the. <laughs> oh, oh, I am already planning my top five unique downloads of, the year. of this podcast or whatever. I've been. actually been thinking about our top five because that's coming soon. We're going to be recording our top five in like a month or like six weeks, and oh my goodness, I have some from the very beginning of the year that like I have been holding on to. Like they're so good. So. You're so it, it, it's such our personalities and the way we do our lives because it'll be three days before that damn episode and i'm going to be listening to you know 15 hours or whatever it is a podcast yeah. do you know what yeah, i'm saying cram. yeah oh, I, I know i was like ah no I and amy's like oh i have them correlated they're in my google account i do plan them yes so. i've already sent them to nils have you sent them amy it's in four weeks yeah. yeah, well, maybe you're just waiting because you think that that final podcast. That little nugget. Right, there'll be something yeah. really good on the next podcast. Right, I want, it, I, want, I want the whole cohort. I want everything. Well, so there you go. The, so you yeah. got, uh, this is November 15th. There's one more podcast before our top five. So Ooh. there might be one more episode, one more chance yeah. for us to say something and good. I just don't think anything's coming out of the research episode, so. Maybe, well, we'll see. Your research is up first. Tell us what your research is into. Yeah. What, so you're, what you're into is your research. It's a cool study. It's from the British Journal of Medicine, Sports Medicine, I think. British Journal of Sports Medicine. And it's actually done on American uh, patients, which I found very interesting. But it looked at dose response, association of aerobic and muscle strengthening physical activity with mortality. And... Dose response means that how much at the baseline do you need to reduce your mortality? And that was why this study was unique. It was looking at the baseline, not how much can you do, but it's like what minimal amount can you do to reduce mortality? Hmm. So that's what it was looking at. Um, It was a prospective study. It used questionnaires, which, Amy, how good are questionnaires? Well, they're pretty terrible. Yeah. However, people have a very poor memory when it comes to writing stuff down dude i worked out 12 times last mm-hmm. week <laughs> my rate of we all have a friend like that yeah. like i've been working out so much and you're like no you haven't yeah you might be at the gym that much but are you really working <laughs> yeah you went to the gym and you said you did muscle strengthening exercises which involved you picking up the water bottle and like leaving the gym but yeah um but there was minimal evidence that existed surrounding minimum effective doses And why this caught my eye, and there's other studies like this that Amy and I reviewed, is really things are changing. Amy, the times are changing. Historically, we've all heard, um, you know, follow the food pyramid and do some running and some like cardio, cardio aerobic exercise, and that's all you need to do. But what they're finding out now is that strength training, something that Amy and I are very much into and Nils is too, 
is very life positive, not just for functionality, not just for quality of life, not for aesthetics, but also for lifespan and literally for mortality. And this is these studies that are coming out in the past four to five years are really focusing on the muscle uh, strength training mm -hmm. component, uh, which is new. Well, that's, I mean, I have said this for a very long time that muscle is an organ of longevity. Absolutely is. And you see this in, I mean, the correlations may not have been made before, but in things like hip fractures and other long bone fractures, I mean, your existing muscle mass when you have an injury like that is hugely indicative of how, of your outcome and even your, your ability to live through those kinds of injuries. Yeah, my mother-in-law who passed away, unfortunately, um, had a hip fracture and I looked up the data when she had it and she was already deconditioned. So I knew that the prognosis was bad and she ultimately ended up dying after that injury. Uh, in a long drawn out process, but I think it was over 65 or 67 years of age. The so mortality in America from people to fall down with hip fractures is extremely high. Oh, it's over the age of 50 yeah. is when we looked at recently the yeah. data. For yeah. all comers. Yep. So, and you think about that, that's a huge uh, killer in people that are in their, you know, fifth, sixth, and seventh decades mm -hmm. of life, eighth decades, obviously. So I think that thinking about your life even if you're younger, and making sure that strength training or muscle, what do they call it, muscle strengthening physical activity is involved in your weekly routine is imperative. These The data shows that you don't have a choice anymore. We live in a place where everyone wants to go out and run forever. That's great and all, but that's not, and you think about it, dose-dependent response, that's not qualifyingly helping you in totality. Yeah, and if you care about aging, it's probably making you not age very right. well either. So you have to <laughs> or have how you look when you age. You have to you have to have some sort of mixture, right? Um, the, the, with your weekly routine that's done over a long term time frame. So they looked at the National Health Interview Survey data again from 1997 to 2014. That's a long time, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it included almost 500,000 adults from the United States. Now, obviously. They just don't take all comers, people that were incarcerated. It was so funny, the ones they left out. People that have disabilities, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, other things. But it was a lot of people, a lot of diverse people. Men and women? Men and women, both. They looked at activity levels, were reported using a standardized questionnaire, which Amy and I now know fully that that's problematic. But there's not many other things you can do. Yeah, you can't put people in a cage for 30 years. Now, you could... <laughs> Or like all these new devices, these connected devices may change the game on that, right? Oh, they already are. They're yeah. absolutely using those to, so, to mine data. Like 100%, you can tell if I'm working at or not because I got an aura ring on and it measures my heart rate. Now, I would have to opt into that, but that would be an easy way to weed out the, the BS, you know, and find out exactly what people are doing. Uh, the study adhered to the strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology, the strobe guidelines nice. so it's like the irb of yeah, yeah i know it's so funny when he's looking at this i looked up strobe and provides a readily available checklist to ensure clear and presentation of what was planned and conducted in the observational study mm -hmm. so and then they used some modeling when one of this was the cox proportional hazard model which is really interesting and uh it showed it's used to evaluate physical activity and mortality This in this Cox proportional hazard model was. Uh, it's a regression model commonly used in statistical and medical research for investigating association between survival times and patients and predict predictive variables. So that's what it did. Uh, it was really interesting. So Amy, have you read this study? Nope. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. In this study... Compared to no aerobic physical activity, was there a mortality risk reduction with people that did aerobic physical activity? Yes or no? Uh, so a, a mortality risk reduction. Yeah. I would say yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So <laughs> if you actually do aerobic stuff, you're going to live longer per the data. All right. How many hours a week, the maximum hours a week, did the benefit was there a benefit there and then it started to level mm, off okay. so what was the maximum hours yep. per week before the scale started to tip in the opposite before direction. it just plateaued and then it didn't offer any more benefit 10 so nils i would say i wish we could query the users i wish this was live and we could have the users query mm -hmm. what hours, right? 
Yeah. Four. Okay, Nil says four. I said ten. Amy says ten. Amy's way off. That just shows you where her well, that also, like, brain is. I'm like, yeah. well, I lived for ten, about ten, yeah. ten hours. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not eating, you should be running. So no, it was three hours. So all these people that run for like massive amounts of times, it's not, at least in terms of mortality, making any difference. Well, I mean, you start to affect recovery and muscle breakdown. I mean, so much happens when you're having extended periods of activity like that. So the muscle strength training, they didn't question what they were doing. Right. Right. So this is a huge problem. Yeah, it's subjective. It's 100% subjective. Like sometimes I run and my heart rate's 140. Other times I run and it's like 95. So, you know, I mean, aerobic activity is not not comparison. And right. The, well, yeah. that's I mean, strength training even more so because I yeah. might be doing a really heavy set of squats and my heart rate is 160. <laughs> and again, I could be running and my heart rate's 120. Right. And uh, so I, I found that interesting. So how many times a week, the maximum amount of times a week, did it start to plateau when there was no benefit to reducing mortality? Times, not duration. That's so, the, see, that also is so subjective. So I mean, what? I'm going re- to read the way this was stated because it was a little How bit confusing. How the people work out twice a day? Muscle 12? strengthening exercise conferred <laughs> additional mortality risk reduction on top of aerobic activity at one time a week, but was no longer beneficial at seven times a week. Okay, so I said six. Yeah. All right. So I was pretty close on that so one. So I don't know if that means that six is the maximum or one to six is the same. Or that eight is too many. Yeah. So obviously there's maximums, and remember this is looking at dose dependent response and broad population. Right. I mean. Men and women have different rates of recovery. Ages of people have different rates of recovery. You know, if you do one really intense leg day and you go right back and try and do legs the next day, are you getting the maximum benefit from it? No. No. Are you damaging your mitochondria? Probably. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that gets into (laughs) extreme situations. So many variations there. So, but it was really interesting. For sure, aerobic activity at the most three hours a week definitely reduces your mortality. But if you want to reduce your mortality risk even further, then you can add on muscle strengthening exercises at least one time a week, no more than seven times a week. Hmm. I I feel like uh, Dr. Campbell and like his in University of Florida, I feel like they have studied this much more in trained individuals, like the minimum effective dose. And it is interesting because, you know, there's podcasts I listen to a lot, the Mind Pump podcast and Sal DiStefano is one of the main hosts on that. And he talks about, you know, 60 minutes a week of strength training. And I think that your intensity and your focus are those things that matter because someone, as you said, could spend literally two hours in the gym and not get the intensity out of a workout that someone who was extremely trained and very focused could get in 20 minutes. And that's where I think these, it's so tough when you're looking at population exercises this way. Yeah, and especially like in the, in that population, like Sal and those kind of people who are already super jacked and already well, he's have- a trainer. I know, but yeah. they already have such a baseline foundation mm-hmm. that 60 minutes may be like finishing off this amazing well, or someone who's completely deconditioned. Yeah. 60 minutes might be enough. Right. Also, definitely with strength training, less for me with aerobic, but I'm sure if I was really into aerobic exercise, maybe I would feel this way. For sure, if you're more focused. I mean, they've shown that if you actually are doing bicep curls and you think about, close your eyes or open muscles your eyes. Firing, and think yes. about your muscles doing yep. a biceps curl, that you actually get more from that exercise, mm-hmm. that you get more of an effect. Yeah, the mind muscle connection is not placebo. Literally thinking about what you're doing right yeah. at that moment or even probably even thinking about it beforehand and then doing it. So, that kind of component, HRV, we've talked about that, wh- how you're feeling that day. Um, there's so many different variables yeah, your that sleep, can affect your nutrition. It. I think and especially for normal people and I consider us normal people. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think you've ever said that about me before. That uh, might be the nicest that you've ever said to me. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong on no. that. Uh, uh, normal. We're semi-normal. I don't know. Partially normal. Is that uh, young Frankenstein? Like yeah. Abby? Abby someone? Yeah, yeah. Abby normal. So I think that if, if you think about us um, and for people that aren't uh, physique or bodybuilder kind of people, people that live fairly normal lives, mm-hmm. I think that what matters the most is consistency and building into your routine something that has aerobic activity for at least three hours. Uh, muscles, no more than three hours. Yeah, I'm sorry, no more than three hours. That's what I meant to say. Uh, muscle strengthening exercises, preferably daily. I think it would be good. But uh, if you are into more aggressive training styles, then you need days off. You need that for recovery. 
and for muscle building, but for the standard person, at least something, you know, four or five, six times a week that involves strength training. Um, just having those two things is going to, per the data, massively. How much longer effect. did they live? Oh, I, they didn't say. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so. They didn't say even like yeah. they didn't say. All no, right. it wasn't like a total. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. It was just mortality in general, and they yeah. were looking at mortality as a you know, are they alive or not during this study? So not even healthy lifespan. Yeah. Huh. Man, there's so many more places to go with this. Oh, it's it's crazy, and it, I mean the study is is limited because it's a prospective study on questionnaires on well, the humans. whole population. It's be. Yeah, but like I think it it disproves that strength training. It's always been the redheaded stepchild for a long time in medicine. Not once did I go through medical school that people say you should really encourage your patients to do strength training and functional exercises. Which is ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. When you consider how important muscle mass is to I mean, the only thing adults. that's transformed my life besides getting married, having children, and going to medical school is strength training. And I know that I'm an N of one, but. But you're not. There's 500,000 U.S. adults right. who also showed right. that you're not. My whole life changed. Yes. You know, and uh, I was healthy beforehand. I, I've i always been able to run marathons. I, but what if you had stayed on that path 10 years later? No, it would have been terrible. I would have had back problems. Right, you'd have terrible knees. You'd probably yep. have a knee replacement exactly. from all of your running yep. and no, no muscle mass. Yep. There's this idea of um, sarcopenia, loss of muscle over time. And Amy and I have talked about this a lot. There's an endemic in this country of sarcopenia of yeah. people that are older. Uh, it, all, the frail, the idea of frailty as you age is a death knell. I mean, like literally, if you become frail, then your, you know, your likelihood of, of dying just goes way up. From all causes. From all causes. Like including yeah. small things like a trip and a fall. Right. So if I'm lucky enough to get through my life without cancer and a, a trauma, some sort of trauma, and that's what gets people, cancer or trauma and heart disease. But if I'm, which ultimately is a, an age related, yeah, preventable but, yeah. thing. So cancer, trauma, and heart disease. If you can avoid those three main things, then in reality, you you can die of old age, and that's what a lot of people do. And and you want to be in your 80s and 90s if you're lucky enough to live that long and be functional, to have strength, to have range of motion. And we saw a patient today who was 76, standing perfectly upright. She, um, what does she do? She does something. Well, she's trying to retire. <laughs> yeah, but she does something with surfboarding or something like that. She's 76 years old, standing straight up. She had, you know, visible muscles. You could see her deltoids. You could see the muscles across her chest. And although you know she's in her 70s, you can tell by her face, her body language just the way that she was standing right it's the way you carry yourself the way she carried herself yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying like mentally i'm saying physically mm -hmm. it was just remarkable I think it, was, the, it was it was inspiring i mean i was looking at this i'm like this is what i want i want this for my life and my kids and my friends and my family for them to have functional lives into their 70s and 80s and to you know do what you want to do Looking okay, at the way people walk as they age, I think is such an interesting thing that you, you don't really notice when you're a young person, but as you start to get older and you look at things like that, you can have a person who has had a lot of plastic surgery and looks very, very nice in the face and walks like they are literally walking I've towards time, death's yeah. door, you know? And that's what this patient today, she had to walk a gait of a healthy person. Yeah, You know, those are things and her muscle mass, as we've talked about a lot in our other podcast, it is very challenging as a woman to gain significant muscle over the age of 40. Like what you have built up to that point is now you're just trying to maintain it. Your protein need increases exponentially over the age of 60. I had a conversation with another patient today who was late 60s, early 70s and was struggling to keep weight on because of G, um, gastrointestinal issues. Mm -hmm. And I told her that protein intake is, it, w any way you can, it's gonna be the most, above all it's else. the most important thing you can yeah. do right now. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, no, really. Because your body gets less efficient at being able to break down all these amino acids. So your your need for it's protein It's just gonna be robbing up. your body. Yep, just of break those, down your muscle. Just break down your muscle yep. to, to be able to kind of get by. Mm -hmm. That's and, the last thing you want. Right, and it was an interesting conversation and she can't eat that many things. She has a lot of food allergies. I said, what about peanut butter? I'm like, okay, get a protein shake with peanut butter in it. It's not maybe the best option, but that's high calorie, good fats. <laughs> And then good protein source. So these are things that you're, you're you're always thinking about that. And you know it's funny. Like I know that Amy and I are weird, but like I I go out. No one's thinking about that. I'm not saying that people aren't as healthy as I am. They don't look good or stuff. But you, in the long term, what is that doing? 
Like, yep. right? The now is okay, but what about five years from now? What about 10 years from now? No one thinks like right. that. Right, how do you, well, and even more than that, how do you want your eighth, eighth decade of life to look? And then backtrack from there. You yeah. know, if you want to have a body mass index at a certain percent when you're 80, well, then you better make sure, or a VO2 max, or whatever it is that are your markers of health, blood pressure, all those things, if you aren't exceeding those, far exceeding those in your 40s and 50s, you aren't going to get there by the time you're 80. So, it, and that's not the way people think. It's just not. People don't think that way. Even, you know, who have aging parents and those other things, I think we all want to believe that that is somehow not our path. And if you truly don't want it to be your path, you have to make changes or make steps in your life to change that. I mean, weightlifting is a great example of that. You know, people are very afraid somehow of weightlifting or women specifically, but you don't get a chance to go back and build muscle that you didn't build. Yeah. Or eat protein that you could have eaten when you could digest it and were doing well to, to build up those stores. You don't have that chance. Right. You, you can't redo your decades of life. Yeah. And there's a kind of a subset of the population, cultish subset of the population that believes that severe calorie restriction is the way to longevity. That's getting smaller and smaller as the studies are actually being done. Right, because they did some rat studies. We've talked about mTOR before and whatever Amy's pathways is. She loves all the names that I can't AMPK. remember. AMPK. AMPK, yeah. <laughs> it's the AM part. You know? Yeah, I like the AMs. Yeah, but that just seems, if you just use logic, great. So you live an extra five years, but you're deconditioned, you have sarcopenia or lack of muscle and you're frail. Yeah, no, I always say no one wants to be the scared mouse. Because those mice do extremely poorly on cognitive things. They end up like hiding out and being mm -hmm. afraid. Like you're not living your best life. You are absolutely not. And I, I challenge you to find a single aged person who says that they wouldn't have enjoyed being healthy for five more years versus just living for five more yeah. years. And I think the second part of that is too, yeah, deprivation is important. Uh, what's the word? Hormesis? Hermesis, yeah. yep. stress. Stress yep. to a, like any, sauna, any kind of organism is yes. positive. So you can do short stints of... of uh, but it's good till it isn't. That's also dose dependent. Are, is your What is your article about? Is it about... Uh, We're I'm fasting. I'm deep diving about fasting. fasting. I, was about to, I yeah. knew it was. I didn't even look yep. at yours. So it's, that was about short stints of fasting, mm -hmm. uh, which Amy will talk about. That has a true benefit. But overall, uh, building and exercise and strength training should be part of the kind of foundation of your entire mm -hmm. life. It doesn't have to be aggressively. It could just be, you know, uh, But it should weights. be focused enough that you get progressive overload. You should get some progressive overload. If you're just rocking those baby pink one pound weights for 20 years, I'm sorry. You've maxed out the first week you were training. Just think of Olivia Newton-John. Yeah, you know? like that's it. Like so, you, you made your gains that first week and then. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was neurodegenerative diseases and the data on that also with strength training is they, that's less common. So. Well, I talked about that. What was the podcast where we talked about uh, things we wish we knew about aging? Yeah. Specifically, the pathways that they're finding now and the chemical signaling when you contract muscle, that it actually activates parts of your brain. Mm -hmm. So like, there is a direct link between neurodegenerative conditions and muscle mass. That mind-muscle connection is the same thing as neuroplasticity. It's mm -hmm. the same process going on um, that you're building these new pathways. And uh, anyone who lifts heavy weights, not that that's me, but people that really get into that. The, you the, lift heavy weights. I mean, not like some of the people you're talking about. Seriously. Okay. <laughs> like, you, like you walk by the All front right. desk and everybody's like, oh my God, look at his arms. Okay, look at his arms. Yeah. <laughs> what, am I going to take that on the road? <laughs> I mean, it's not the worst thing. Yeah. But I do think that, um, yeah, it's something that we, all of us, all of us listening should really try to put that into your d database and build that into your life. Because I am the type of person that feels when I'm down and stressed, I just need to go out and run and do these things. And um, I think that that's wonderful because it helps your brain. It helps your neurotransmitters. It stabilizes, probably releases some dopamine. It Absolutely. Just yeah. makes you Serotonin. Feel, yeah. Makes you feel better. It's like if you have an ADD kind of brain, it probably does the same thing that Adderall does. But in reality, if you're talking about true benefit to your life, it has to have strength training in there too. And consistent strength training over time. Progressive overload. So awesome. that was my article. Awesome. I love it. Let's take a quick break. We're going to come back in. We're going to talk all about deprivation. <laughs> We're going to talk about my study. <laughs> Dr. Martin, I'm super excited to talk about our sponsor for this podcast. Let's get checked. 
You, if you've been a listener of a podcast, you know that we have never had a sponsor before, and that's because we're an educational podcast. We're not looking to monetize, and we also would never recommend something that we didn't believe in and or use ourselves. So basically, you're saying we're very choosy. We're very choosy yeah. when we come to our last good, our testing, but yeah. let's get checked is really aligns with our values. We talk a lot about monitoring your blood values of certain things. We talked recently about vitamin D serum levels. We talk a lot about hormone levels, and it's hard for some people to get to a lab or you're afraid of the blood draw or just, you know, you're concerned about confidentiality, like you have a lot of concerns and you just don't do it. Let's Get Checked makes it super easy because it's completely confidential. You do it from your home. So there's really no excuse not to do it. Yeah. And we did it recently. Both Amy and I did it. She looked at her women's health, um, basically her hormone levels. And I looked at mine on the men's health side with testosterone. It was very simple. You go online, their online um, interface is really easy to use and good. Uh, we got the testing kit very quickly and the test itself, actually doing the stick, you do a stick on the end of your finger is not hard to do. It only took about three to four minutes. You put it back in a sealed envelope that's confidential, goes back to them. You get your results in two to five days. It's really that simple. And the best part is it's about empowerment, about you taking control and trying to do things that are positive for your health and life. And this is one way to do it literally from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, so they offer a wide range of tests. So they do men's and women's hormone panels. They do a full panel of STD testing. They also are now offering a COVID-19 test at home. So there are a lot of other just basic blood levels that you can get tested as well. And one of the things that we always say is you can't track what you don't check. So you might not know what's normal for you in the future if you're not checking it now, especially as it relates to hormones and men's health specifically, I feel like is a little bit under treated. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, sperm crowns are dropping by a large percentage in men these days. Most men um, struggle at some point in their lifetime with low testosterone. And those men do not know what the symptoms of low testosterone are. Depression, anxiety, sleep problems, osteopenia or loss of bone, loss of muscle and something we treat all the time, gynecomastia or male breast growth. These are real problems that can be been, you know, that can be improved or treated with testosterone. And these men do not know their levels. It's so easy to get checked. And this is why we're so excited about the sponsor. Yeah. And let's get checked as a completely CLIA certified lab, the CIL CLIA lab. So they're a well-established, completely safe lab to use. You do get contacted after, so you get your results. I got a text at 4.30 in the morning, which I loved, uh, that my results were ready. And we're both up at 4.30, yep, so, so that was, was good. Super excited. And you have access to not only a nurse, but also a physician. So a physician does review your results, and it gives you a little breakdown of like where you're sitting on those levels. Um, Dr. Martin's had even comparisons of like where two of the levels should be in relation to each other, which is a really important thing to note. Right. You know, Just being within the normal range is not always enough. So it really gave more information than that. You'd still want to, of course, reach out to your own doctor if you needed some additional assistance with these labs or you did see something that was concerning. Um, we didn't, thankfully. So that was good. Yeah, yeah. We, were all, we were both good. You know, this podcast is about empowerment. It's educational in my private practice. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. We are all about empowerment and this is one way to do it. So we're very excited about the sponsorship and we're looking forward to using it for our patients moving forward. Yeah. So as a listener of our podcast, if you're also a new time user to Let's Get Checked, which a lot of you probably are, we do have a 20% discount code. So you do need to go to our specific URL and it is linked in the description box below, but it's going to be try LGC. So T R Y L G C like let's get checked dot com slash beauty B E A U T Y and you'll need to use the code beauty twenty at checkout beauty again is B E A U T Y twenty two zero and you can pick a test like any test you'd like put in our code and get your test shipped to you getting tested is the right thing to do it's uh lets you know where you're at and what's responsible all right well let's get tested let's get tested let's get checked let's get checked yeah. <laughs> and we're back. So we're all going to go home and eat some protein and lift weights, but then we're going to listen to my studies and think we need to not eat again ever. Don't ever eat <laughs> yeah. again. So, I mean, it is the duality of life, right? Like, But this is the point, and this is where dose dependency is absolutely, in my two studies, more than anything else, the dose or the medicine, you know, the dose makes the poison is very true. And I'm specifically because I'm going to be talking about two studies that were recently released. These are both- Of course you had to do two studies. Well, because- the, I, they're both new research on fasting, and rather than like go too deep, they're both one of them in particular. The You're one on the breast cancer nerdzilla that had the clicky pins in school, right? That all the different colors, the four colors. Yeah. Oh heck yeah, I did. You yeah. suck. And not only did I have the one that was black, red, blue, and green, but I also had one that was pink, purple, light blue, and like aqua. Oh my god. Yeah, that's so them. extra. Yes, very extra. And it was pink. It always felt like the green. I was like, God, I, I want to use the green. 
Like I want to use it, but nah, because the black was good, and then the red was like you really got to know this, and the blue was kind of like to circle things. The green kind of like got overpowered. I think most people circle things in red or underline them in red. No, red was always to me like you know, dude, you better. This is important. Uh, see, mine was more like, oh, you're in trouble. Like yeah. red. Red means anger. So. There has been a lot of research coming out specifically about the fasting modified diet. And if you are interested in learning more about that specifically and what it entails, we did a great podcast all about fasting toward the beginning of 2022, where I talk specifically about my experience doing the fasting modified diet. And I've done it many times since then. And as the research is coming out, the really cool thing about this protocol, the fasting mimicking diet, is that it is something that is being scientifically researched. It is very challenging. You know, I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and nutrition is very much like this smoke and mirrors religious style thing in most people's minds. Think aesthetic surgery. <laughs> yeah. And and people are very it's the same quality. Undereducated. Like, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff going on and there's a lot of things being thrown around that doesn't have any data behind it. Well, and it's as we've talked about many times before, it's nearly impossible to do nutrition studies because you you cannot do double blind studies. You would have to keep two identical people alive in the exact same conditions. And then what have you done? You've studied two people. Those things don't translate. They don't translate because you've kept them in a bubble, like there were no external forces on them. Epigenetics is huge in all of this. So you do somewhat have to go to animal studies. And when we talk about how studies are broken down, a lot of times we talk about animal studies. So get used to that. These were both done on animals. And one of the studies actually is in human testing right now, and that is the study on Alzheimer's. So both looking at applications for using fasting mimicking diet for specific types of triple negative breast cancers that are highly resistant to any type of treatment even immunotherapy treatment and these IgG treatments. And the IgG therapy for any type of cancer can be really awesome, but it can also be very deadly. They can cause anaphylaxis. Like you can have extremely bad reactions to these. So they're not used in a lot of cases. So triple, triple negative breast cancer. So breast cancers, uh, we look at three hormonal receptors. We look at estrogen, uh, progesterone, and herceptin, right? Or... or um, uh, Herceptin, maybe that's the medication, her two new. Um, anyways, there's three different things we look at at breast cancers. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can have hormonally directed treatments. Like, for example, if your breast cancer is ER positive, you could use something called tamoxifen or block aromatase estrogen. inhibitors and block estrogen. Uh, the same thing with progesterone. There's certain things that do that. And then Herceptin is the one for the her two new positive breast cancers. Uh, which is the medication that blocks that pathway. And that can be a, a certified treatment for breast cancer. But if you're triple negative, those per the data are way more aggressive than a standard hormonally positive breast cancer. And those people tend to present often per, with progressed disease, FYI. Yeah. And, and I've I've personally seen it. They're younger. They're it's progressed. It's pr really a difficult kind of problem to treat. Yeah. And that's when you have to go to these second line therapies. A lot of those patients that are triple negative and they come pr with progressed disease, they will get uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Sorry to go into the same. No, thing. it's they, good. Okay. Yep. They will get neoadjuvant chemotherapy before they do their mastectomy or their lumpectomy or whatever treatment for the breast cancer because actually these triple negatives do somewhat respond to chemotherapy because they're pretty aggressive and growing fast. Chemotherapy works better on faster growing things because that's how it affects the ability for the Stop cancer the cells turn yeah, over. to turn mm -hmm. over. So it's very interesting. Um, and then the immunotherapies are this kind of second line therapies that they're doing now as treatment for these really difficult cancers. And by the way, immunotherapies are common in a lot of cancers now. We've mm -hmm. talked or I've alluded to the fact that Melanoma, they're doing immunotherapies or, you know, basically immune therapies that have drastically changed the game on melanomas and saved people's lives. Yeah. So. so to avoid going way too deep, this study on breast cancer was extremely complex, like extremely. Reading through this research article, like when you really read through it, I mean, it was, I would say, 20 plus pages of what mostly doesn't even feel like you're reading English because it's primarily just acronyms and other things. So what was that? article that I reviewed that was from China. It was like everything oh, right. was a medical work. That was the one on uh, that was the effects of anesthesia. Oh, yeah. 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 That, that was, one was so really difficult to read. Yeah. But at least it was short. It was <laughs> short. It was like 10 pages. Yeah. This the, is the only thing harder oh. that I've ever read was a mortgage. If you've ever read the mortgage papers, it is full of legalese. You cannot. Everything is a run on sentence. 
and none of it makes any sense. Well, take that and basically it's like read, reading something in Spanish. Pretend I mean, you were reading three mortgages at once because what they did in this study was they had multiple multiple studies going on at the same time, right? Because you have to have a control. You have a fasting only. You have a standard diet. You have a fasting with immunotherapy. You have a, a standard with immunotherapy. And then you have several different varieties of mice which have different types of uh, mutations essentially. And they implant this breast cancer into these mice at about three months of age, three to four months of age. So you know, if you want to be, you want to confuse yourself, read the, either one of these articles, but specifically this one about breast cancer. So I'm going to go over the highlights. You can deep dive into the specifics of how they got to each of these endpoints, but these are the highlights of this study. And I, there's a point in why I'm talking about these specifically. So overall, they did find that the fasting mimicking diet in, in conjunction, so they're not saying that the fasting mimicking diet does this by itself, in conjunction with IgG immunotherapy slows tumor growth and extends survival or lifespan, as I like to call it. It also preserves spleen structure and function, which is something that gets degraded with IgG therapy. So that enhances the immune response as well. Our spleens are important. Most people don't know what a spleen does. There was a boost or an increase in anti-tumor response by promoting T cell activation and by reactivating what are called early dysfunctional effector T cells. There's also late dysfunctional effector T cells, but these early ones are far more efficient at fighting the tumor, essentially. The late ones are not so much, and that's probably why they're called early and late. The fasting mimicking protocol was shown to upregulate glycolysis and glutathione metabolism. We've talked a lot about glutathione. It's kind of this amazing detoxification substance that the body really needs. It's kind of a master metabolism thing, which promoted a shift from glycolysis to an oxidative phosphorylation. So again, making the cells better able to utilize energy in a proper way to make these changes to the tumor which that they needed to. We've alluded to that kind of stuff in the fasting episodes that we've had. Correct. If all of these are an effect of fasting. Right. That you can utilize energy sources better, that you have better cleaning of house of you know, all your kind of these kind of more immune cell functionings. Right. But right? how that is specifically impacts tumor growth is what's unique. So yes, those things happen all over the body, but why does that help a tumor, right? It, and if you just do the fasting mimicking protocol, it doesn't. There's no, no improvement at all because well, all these things are happening in the body, but... Mm -hmm. There's it. You need kind of the combination therapy in these specific types of breast cancers to then help the tumor, and this is why. So you're getting a higher percentage of T cells. You get an increase in the tumor infiltrating microphages, and that's really where the beauty comes in. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that this, when you're doing the fasting mimicking diet, it normalizes the tumor vasculature, but also the extracellular matrix around the tumor. These tumors get really tightly bound collagen fiber de depositions in them. And when you're doing nothing can get into it, right? And so that's no, why the internal part gets necrotic. Yeah, correct. So there's no blood flow. So when you're what they see though, when they actually biopsy these tumors after they've been on the fasting mimicking protocols, that it it's it's loosened, it's thinned out, so that the collagen fibers have gotten thin mm -hmm. and reduced and more sparsely distributed, so that the blood flow then can increase into the tumor. So the one thing that was I found the most fascinating, these types of therapies are very hard on the mouse, right? By the time you've had, they've given them five cycles, 100% of the mice die. Mm. And then sometimes they'll go into anaphylaxis within 20 minutes of getting the injection. Like it's very fast. They have a rapid increase in all of these inflammatory processes and they basically die. The mice that were doing the fasting mimicking diet, they had an 80% survival mm. rate. And the 20% that died did so after the fourth dose, essentially. So after the fifth, I mean, whereas 100% of the control animals and the ones on standard diet died. 100%. Yeah, I mean, so technically an immunotherapy is chemotherapy. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it would be lumped under that. And there is known benefits of fasting with chemotherapy. So the same th rules apply that you would probably get some somewhat of a similar benefit with yeah. immunotherapies. But immunotherapies can have really, really strong responses. Yeah. I know the one for melanoma, um, people have intense uh, gastrointestinal issues, mm -hmm. diarrhea, and some of them can't they can't continue the treatments, which yeah. would be devastating. And the dropout, I mean, when you're a mouse, you don't get to drop out, you just basically, they give these to you until you die. Yeah. But the really cool thing that was the takeaway from this in my mind, I mean, yes, fasting is great because it does all these other things in your body, which we talk about in detail on the fasting episode. It increases a lot of things in your body, it, it does all these great things, but what they really found when they were looking at these tumors after the cycles of the fasting mimicking diet was that it basically, your cells know what to do when you fast. Your mm -hmm. normal healthy cells see this as a great time for autophagy, for cleanup, for cellular functions that they know they need to do. They basically thrive in this environment because they know what to do. The tumor cells don't. 
they are so like sugar hungry in most cases, like they are feeding off this constant glycolysis cycle. They don't know what to do. Right. Which so is, they kind of panic. Which is if you ever look at cancer diets and anyone, someone listening to this may have had cancer and I'm sorry, and, and looked up these cancer diets, most of those are fairly low in, um, Oh, they're very low in sugar because you're, sugar. and carbs. That's yeah, and why carbs, keto yeah. is so great for and that's I was most about to cancers. say that, yeah, keto is off, mm-hmm. is often the way that they recommend going, like a keto diet, and it's you know it's the idea that you're starving these cancer areas of sugar that, that want to yeah. grow really fast and need all this energy and this fast energy, like uh, like for example glycolysis, which is making glucose. So. Yeah. But I mean, that's even taking this a little further. And this is why I'm combining it with then talking about the Alzheimer's study is because you have somebody who is going through aggressive breast cancer. You tell them they have to eat a ketogenic diet the entire time, like patient compliance, diet fatigue, all of these things are going to be very, very high. Whereas if you told someone you just need to fast, you know, right around the times of your treatment, whenever you're having those. Which is what they do for the chemotherapy one. So it's similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, not only is that making the treatment you're getting, as you can see, far more effective. And this is what was so interesting when you do nutrition studies where you actually show a regular standard diet, healthy diet for this mouse, right? Normal healthy diet, not a standard American diet, like literally just a healthy diet for a mouse versus the fasting mimicking diet versus, not, you know, the interventions on both sides. That's really where you see that like these things in combination are very powerful. So it's not just fasting of no food or trying to do keto for extended periods of time. Like there is potentially a way to make your body respond better and that you can actually prove it. And again, this was in mice. Mice metabolism is very different than a human metabolism. They respond a lot differently and a lot more quickly. They also did shorter duration. They didn't do five days with most of these mice. They did four because a mouse has a shorter lifespan. Like all of their their life cycle, their time clock is slightly different than a human. So trying to make it more realistic to a mouse, right? But there's still, we don't know that there's direct correlation to people. However, you know, like Dr. Martin said, this is already the recommendation in a lot of cancer treatment is to fast. So around the time of the chemotherapy right. administration because it's making your body you know a little bit more able to, uh, to handle to, it to handle it and mm-hmm. tolerate it yeah. and there's already so many things we do around chemotherapy and again amy and i are not experts in this so Mm-mm. please do no. not write comments nope. on about how we did not get this correct but we're interested in it uh, we already do things around chemotherapy that help people mm-hmm. one of the things is cold caps for hair loss yep. hair loss is really common in chemotherapy because chemotherapy hits the quickly dividing uh, cell areas like tumors and your hair. Your hair mm-hmm. divides all the time. Well, it keeps on growing. Nails too. Your, Skin, so, intestinal yeah. lining. Like that's why your gut gets completely destroyed. Yeah. So um, they they found with these, it was so interesting. They, they, they put these cold caps on uh, during the time of administration. I think even afterwards, I'm not really sure what yeah, the, the cryo cap, the cryo cap. And uh, you can really salvage your hair. Mm-hmm. Which think about that emotionally speaking, if you're going through chemotherapy, yeah. especially if you had a triple negative cancer, you're getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, cancer th- th- therapy before you even have surgery, you mm-hmm. have to go through chemotherapy and you're probably gonna end up having radiation afterwards. The fact that you can at least salvage your hair. Yeah, something is humane. It's not nothing. You know. Yeah. But yeah. it's this is so, so interesting. It's really the I this idea that we're gonna vacillate uh, at times of need with this fasting mimicking mm-hmm. diet and utilize this to our advantage. If you don't have cancer, obviously you can still utilize it in your daily life. Well, not, don't, don't step all over my, my outcomes. Okay. This is my, my, my like practical applications. That's okay. what I'm talking about. Practical applications. All right. So the other study was looking at the same fasting mimicking protocol, but using it in it for Alzheimer's disease. Now, dementia is really challenging and there is need for you know more broad acting safe interventions which there are very few of i mean there are very limited interact or interventions right now dietary interventions have shown effectiveness no there was just a new drug that came out there was but it's specifically for beta amyloid um plaques amyloid plaques but that's not the only reason that right but then but then it was so funny that that drug came out and they said they've they're in a stage three or four trials or right it's like a big deal but then I had just listened to a podcast, I think it was on Joe Rogan, they had a, one of the neuroscientists on there, and he said that the plaques really it's not are, it. are a lost leader. Correct. So, they so I was like, Billions so of dollars in research for a drug that is really not treating the main cause. Well, you don't know or, that. You haven't looked at the data yet. So. I, have, I have looked at it. I actually, I, mm-hmm. I have looked at it. 
Yeah. But like you said, did even, you go to their lab and look it up? Even Joe Rogan is expert is saying like Joe maybe Rogan, this the isn't. expert. <laughs> I said Joe Rogan's expert. <laughs> OK, not, like, Joe Rogan is not the expert. The expert <laughs> that he had on was bringing up that there is not a one cause, at least not that we know. I mean, Alzheimer's disease you know, has a very strong inflammatory component in the brain. And that's what we're really seeing more and more is that there's this hyperactivation of the microglia in the brain that leads to inflammation. Right. It's almost like a cytokine storm in your brain. But it's these microglia being highly activated. Then the plaques form. I mean, it's kind of like cholesterol, right? The cholesterol myth is kind of the amyloid beta myth. Where very it, good it, analogy. Know, Whereas you think it's just because yeah. you have high cholesterol that you're that's the bad thing. Well, really, right. the high cholesterol is maybe in some cases not great, but that's not what's causing the problem. The cholesterol right. has to get into the intima, and then it has to form. It's a right, and it might pathophysiological be, I mean, process. Why right? did you have tears in your endothelium that the cholesterol was exactly. there to block? Right, and then that has yeah. to build upon itself, and then get inflamed yep. and form a hard shell. So it's it's very applicable. Yeah. So just because you you know, it's not patho. It, that's the, the thing was confusing about that. It's not patho mnemonic. If you have amyloid plaques, what they were saying is if you have amyloid plaques, it doesn't. If you did a, uh, an autopsy on someone and you found amyloid plaques, it doesn't mean they had Alzheimer's because no. a lot of people have amyloid plaques. It's just that they it's a common finding with an Alzheimer's um, diagnosis di yes. with, with the Absolutely. autopsy. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. And, you know, we're learning more about all of the APO alleles you know there's one through five also about tau there's so many other things that you know contribute to the formation of the of everything in the brain but one of the things that this study really looked at was what are some they have shown effectiveness with calorie restriction which is what dr martin brought up they've also shown some with um, intermittent fasting but as patients who have actually been diagnosed with alzheimer's or dementia they have compliance issues and also safety concerns. Like you don't want somebody who is maybe not in great health doing extended periods of fasting or extended periods of calorie restriction. They need every ounce of muscle they can have. Like these people can't afford to be losing a lot of weight. So mm -hmm. even though those interventions have shown some promise, they're probably not safe and they have a really low compliance. People with dementia have issues with compliance and eating anyway. So great option, right? Like let's maybe try some fasting mimicking diet on these people on this they started with mice and again two different types of mice some that had tau pathology some that had all of the different human alleles of apoe one through five so again they, they did this all these tests on all these mice but the main things that they saw were that the mice that were doing the fasting mimicking diet had improved cognitive behavior they also had improvement on the you know the the uh, maze studies. And the one interesting thing when they showed this, so they started doing interventions. These are mice that are going to get all dementia, right? They're bred that way. They are bred to have these problems. So they start the fasting mimicking protocol at three months of age and continue until they're done with all their testing, which I, this is where I don't want you to jump on my practical application because this is what's really fascinating to me. This is early intervention. Mm. So they did this at three months and then they oh, did. I'm doing this next week. They did the studies. I, I know at where you're going months. with this. I did not know this. Yes. So at seven months. So just like strength training, we should do some FMDs. Correct. So if you take baseline, right? And you take, so this is baseline trained mouse. They know they've been trained them specifically how to do this maze. And then you take them at seven months of age. The mice that have been doing the fasting mimicking protocol the whole time actually scored better. Mm. The ones that had not, I mean, obviously decompensated a lot because these are mice that are going to get dementia. By the way, the uh, maze in my study was uh, for my post-operative anesthesia yes. effect. It's yes. the same thing. They, well, that's because it's mice. a great way to They're do every, it. I know. But the one thing they saw that they were really fascinated by in the fasting mimicking mice was that they showed more ability to navigate the maze intelligently, meaning they actually didn't have as much like hesitation. Yeah, and that's that, that was in that yep. study too. They talk about the hesitation thing. Right. They spent and more they, time in the open areas. And they, not being and they videotape these poor mm -hmm. animals. And then they look at they're hesitating when they they should take a right or a left. And that's like Do they go back to the same place yep. more than once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really fascinating. So and that's why I, I became then enthralled with this study. The other things that they found was that they reduce in hippocampal and cortex amyloid beta load, amyloid beta peptides, neuroinflammatory cytokines while increasing the hippocampal neurogenesis markers. So all of that is a really fancy way of saying that they reduce these amyloid betas or a reduction in them. The activity in the hippocampus or in the, you know, the neuroinflammatory cytokines in the brain were decreased. Your brain was more active in a positive way versus being essentially overactive in a way that was not beneficial. Mm -hmm. So you don't want your, I mean, I love the microglia, but you don't want your microglia trying to replicate themselves to try and deal with all this chaos in the brain. It's not a healthy brain. Like that's not the way your brain was meant to, to work. And it's also a lot of excess energy doing something that it isn't helping. You know, it's, it's like a cytokine storm. It's, it's trying too hard. 
uh, slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease associated pathology, increased levels of neurogenesis, regulate the microglia levels and activation, and tau phosphor phosphorylation. Very important things when you look at the other causes of neurodegenerative diseases, not just amyloid beta. So there is really cool study, actually. They're doing a human trial right now to assess the feasibility and also the safety. So they actually started out with 40 patients in a nursing home in Italy, and they are this is ongoing. So this is being studied in humans right now. And this is where, this is where, I didn't want you to talk about this because this is what is so cool about all of this. So what if there was something that you could start doing from a young age. I'm that would, listening. Right, that could make your health better. Yes. I mean, the fasting mimicking protocol is not easy per se, but it is definitely far easier than not eating for five days. And for a lot of people, doing a water only fast for even three days is maybe not the safest or healthiest thing to do, but the fasting mimicking protocol is extremely safe as you're going to be a healthy person. I highly recommend it. I think that it's something that all of us could use a little hormesis, right? Be a little uncomfortable. Like, give your body a chance. Like, what if doing this now meant that you didn't have dementia? You don't get, like I said with your studies, you don't get to go back. Nope. You can't go back and fast for the decades before you got dementia. But what you can do is start fasting now. Right. In a smart way. And for most people, that's once a quarter, you know, with the seasons. You know, you fast for five days once a quarter. Why not? You can get the fasting mimicking protocol, which is Prolon, from us. Like, reach out to me. We can have it shipped to you. Like, it's five days. I can help support you through it. Oh, I didn't know we, it comes through us. We are. We are. We are. We are a supply. We're a distributor. Right? Oh, nice. So, so yeah, yeah, you can get it yeah. through our office. Everyone should do it. <laughs> yeah, like, everyone should do it. You know, it's. <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, all, all, jo all joking aside. Yeah, that's awesome. So right. you think you have something potential right now mm -hmm. to decrease your mortality risk, which is strength training. You have something now. Uh, potential, but definitively could decrease your chance of getting Alzheimer's. And by the way, look at the percentages, the growth in the percentage of people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, these neurodegenerative diseases is devastating. It is becoming... Well, these two things, I mean, women, I mean, as a woman... It's becoming an epidemic. Yeah. And you're going to die of breast cancer, you're going to die of dementia. Those are, I mean, yeah. like they're going to get you. Like if you look at like the population, it's aging like now. You're, you're looking at two different things, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at cancer and then cancer treatment and then also neurodegenerative diseases. And you're, you have one um, uh, intervention, which is fasting mimicking diets, and it affects both of those. So mm -hmm. that just shows you how much, how on a baseline level this is affecting your entire body. Yeah, that your cell health is so important. And this is why people are so stuck on autophagy, and they're so stuck mm -hmm. on on uh, mTOR and AMPK and all this kind of stuff that Amy and I like to talk about. Everyone goes snooze fest on. But that's why this is important because clearly this is affecting your body in a grand scale way more than a lot of other things could. If you're a healthy person and you don't smoke and you don't drink, there's not a lot of things besides, you know, making sure you work out and eating whole foods, you know, those basic things. What's the next level after that, right? Like, where do you go from there? And this is definitely one thing that Amy and I would recommend. Well, yeah, and I mean, you look at the results. So for me, especially with when it comes to nutrition, very much like it is with medical professionals, like do no harm is huge. I would never want to recommend something to someone that I had even the thought could harm them. And if you look at the 100% of the mice who were receiving these IgG therapies died after five doses, and 80% of the fasting mimicking mice lived, like. They, they weren't dying faster. I mean, these, these mice lived longer no matter what. I mean, they all died at the end. But if you could do something that you knew wouldn't make your life worse, like you might suffer for a few days, like, but it's really not that hard. And like, oh my goodness, I love watching the increases in my HRV and my decreases yeah. in heart rate. Like, this isn't going to make your life worse for sure. And that I feel good about, you know, like, and there's not a lot in nutrition or in life in general or in medicine where you can say, like, if you do this now, it's not going to make your life worse. I'm not saying it's going to save your life, but... I feel like we're on the precipice of something big, you know, yeah. this is sirtuin pathway stuff. And I know that's mm -hmm. where our headspace is, but looking at these old pathways that are ingrained into our bodies from the beginning of time yeah. and that it's so to think about the irony of that, something that's so old, that's in yeast, that's in eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. I mean, like literally when the meteor hit this earth and somehow carbon was deposited, I don't know. I wish I knew how that happened, but you know. <laughs> You'll uh, go back to the Big Bang. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Day one. Yeah. <laughs> and you think about, so the beginning of time, single cell organisms. And, and like every if, bacteria, everything. Every And then they all had these sirtuin mm -hmm. pathways. And just think about the fact that we're this extremely accomplished and advanced culture with iPhones that Amy told me not to look at because I have too many notifications. Well, but what are those interventions doing? And, and 
Right. They're not making your life better. I can tell you that. That is right. not making your life better. And what we're doing is basically mimicking starvation to activate sirtuin pathways that are the oldest probably pathways in our body that have been passed down since the beginning of time to cure us from all these crazy diseases. Or to give are, us a fighting chance. That are primarily there because we're living too long. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that we're actually. Well, but we're not living too long. We're not living healthy enough. No, nah, we're living too long. We weren't meant yeah. to live this long. I mean, but ultimately what we are know. doing is not living healthy enough. And that is starting from a very young age. And that's the really unfortunate part. I mean, if we look at the health span of people, I mean, we have patients who come in who are in their 80s who are taking zero medications. Zero. Who take multivitamins. We have patients in their 30s who come in who give me a laundry list of prescription medications that they are taking. And I'm like, and they feel terrible. You know, it's like. I feel like our health span is what is the problem, not our lifespan. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, the lifespan becomes a problem if you're living extremely unhealthily. But if, if life ended the day that you became unhealthy. Well, yeah, I mean, but evolutionarily speaking, there's no benefit of living past 35, 40 years of age. Potentially, but there's also no benefit of somebody having diabetes at 80. Right. Like if that person had died when they started having mm -hmm. diabetes. as an, That's just an unwanted effect of getting older and. Right. Your like, body processes start to break down. If you get it when you're 80, if you get it when you're 25 and you live yeah. with it until you're 80, what's the what's the genetic, what's the evolutionary benefit there? Right. There isn't. There's going to be. Evolution was trying to get you. There's going to be some <laughs> medical advancements. I mean, we've talked about this before with these sirtuin pathways and all this stuff that's yeah. going on. There's going to be some sort of pill form that mimics this. But and, how are we going to outwit it? Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I mean insulin used to be that thing, right? That was right. going to cure everything. Yeah. But beta blockers, all these things that were like, this is the thing. And we have figured out a way to work our way around them and yeah. make it even worse for ourselves. I know. Beta blockers are good, actually. Beta blockers are one of the few medications that really are cardioprotective. So if you have a beta blocker on board and you have a heart attack, your chance of survival is way higher, which is so interesting. That's why anyone with atherosclerosis or a cardiac history almost always is going to be on a beta blocker, yeah. you know, just for that reason alone. Yeah, for life expansion. Yeah, life which extension. is weird, right? Like you're taking this pill and somehow it's cardioprotective. Yeah. Body um, is a weird place. Yeah, it is. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so those are the uh, takeaways from, from my studies. And I am telling you what, if you want to just completely numb your mind with the chaos of words and acronyms, read the study on breast cancer, which is linked. Or it read is, your mortgage. It is fantastic. Or, yeah. <laughs> read your mortgage in Spanish and that gets you closer. I mean, I'm going to read this study probably two to three more times. I've already gone through it like a, a great number of times because there is just so much there. But really, at the end of the day, no downside to fasting in either of these. Let's do it. Yeah. So I love our articles. They're actually applicable to your life. Yeah. They're not nerdy sciencey in the end. They're about like, hey, let's make our lives better. You or know, let's it's not, at least not make it worse. Let's not make it worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on, man. And we pick those out randomly or yep. by ourselves. I mean, so that's good. Yeah. So we're improving with our selection process. Oh, I don't know. I feel like some of our other research has been way more fun. I don't feel like my research this time was very fun. Yeah, but, but it's, it's applicable very, to people's yes, lives. Like someone listening to this would be like, okay, this is helpful. Go back and listen to my podcast. We talk about selenium and like oh, quercetin and apples. No. So if you enjoy this podcast and we Ugh. really enjoy you, we really are thankful that you stuck with us. Berberine and glutathione, yeah. yes. fish oil. Awesome stuff. Uh, we love that you listen to this podcast. We know we weren't talking about plastic Cod surgery, but oil. I almost brought you. Oh, I got the Brazilian nuts for Nils. I, you didn't bring You didn't bring them. You see how she said Brazilian nuts? Yeah, I got him some Brazil nuts today. <laughs> and he was joking I've about the Brazilian over. nuts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> These Brazilian nuts. Got a whole bag of them. <laughs> <laughs> Brazilian nuts. Let me share my Brazilian nuts with you. Yeah. Oh, boy. We went downhill in a hurry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so thank you everyone for listening. We really do appreciate it. I would love it if you'd leave me a voicemail. I really would. Um, I'm back to begging for voicemails because I haven't had one in a while. Yeah, and let's I, do it, guys. And I love them. Phone number is 303-630-9038. You can also find all of our social media handles here at the bottom and linked in the description box below. We appreciate everyone coming and staying and listening to research we're into. You know, you think about this fasting mimicking diet. Really, it's, what is this, November 15th? Yeah, it is. Maybe we start that after Thanksgiving. I would actually do it before. I oh, yeah. I would do it the clean, week before Thanksgiving. Clean yourself out beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Give your body a I feel a like it's chance. like that's like two steps forward, three steps back. You know? Shouldn't be. That's one day. Okay. If one day in your life of eating destroys multiple things, like you are doing life wrong. Yeah, that's true. That's like, true. I am sorry. Like, we need to Food talk. Food is fun. Food is fun. Food, Food is, is life. life. Yeah. Food is Eat relationships turkey. and love. It's Food's okay. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. Eat some candy corn. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Wait, candy corn is not that's a Halloween thing, isn't it? 
But you use it for the turkey. <laughs> That's how you make the turkey cookies with the candy corns. Oh my! You can't make turkey cookies without candy no, corns. No, no. If you're talking about Thanksgiving, it's like pumpkin pie and candy corn. Right. Um, sweet potatoes. Candy corn. Turkey. Okay. Candy corn. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Bye. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked offers fast, affordable, and completely confidential health testing for everything from STDs, male and female hormones, and even COVID-19, right from the comfort of your own home. And remember, new customers and listeners of our podcast get 20% off by using our URL, trylgc.com slash beauty, and be sure to use the code beauty20 at checkout. That's try, T-R-Y-L-G-C.com slash beauty and use the code beauty20, beauty, B-E-A-T-U-Y, two zero at checkout. Get checked. It's the right thing to do.